Good afternoon. The committee on Yutsen is back out of recess. I want to thank everyone for your patience. Um, we definitely took more than two minutes. We we're having some um, major technical difficulties that um, hinder us from being able to stream and connect to most of our audience. So we thank you, and I want to thank the testifiers for hanging on. So we're going to try to move as quickly as we can. I want to ask um, those that are in block two, if you could please turn off uh, your cameras, because we're still beginning with the questions in block one. And also the testifiers in block one, um, only those that are speaking um, should turn on their cameras at the moment when they are questioned. We're trying to use as uh, less as trying to keep the bandwidth of the internet available um, so that we could be able to stay on. So I appreciate everyone's um, cooperation in this. So we will continue. We had Senator DeGraff that um, finished his line of questioning. This is a comedian youth sports park and recreation. We're in block one. We will now hear from uh, Senator Carla Joseph. You're up for your seven minutes. And once again, I want to ask everyone to have their cameras off um, until they're answering a question. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Joseph, you may proceed with your seven minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and a pleasant good afternoon to my colleagues as well as to the viewing and listening audience. I'm very happy that we were able to overcome that challenge. My questions are going to be aimed at the testifiers in block one. I will begin, of course, with uh, Honorable Raquel Berry Benjamin, our Commissioner of Education. I have some questioning questions relative to your testimony, and I just needed to get a little bit more specification. And specifically on page three, you talked about hiring some additional personnel. Kindly indicate where are those persons hiring um, in, in your process. Uh, have you interviewed individuals uh, ready for those positions, or are you still in the recruitment uh, component of, of, of your process? Commissioner Barry Benjamin, you heard the question. Good afternoon, Senator Joseph. We we on the Zoom, we did not hear anything that Senator Carrion said as well as yourself. We've been trying to notify you and him that your mics were muted. So we haven't heard anything at all since we came back from recess. Uh, can you hear me now? I can. Please hold the Senate, please hold the senator's time. We would um, start that again. I was saying, uh, thanking the testifiers for hanging on with us. We were experimenting some major technical difficulties, but we're back on. We're requesting that those that are connected through Teams to please turn their cameras off. Uh, those that are in block two to please turn their cameras off. We're still in block one. And in the moment that you're answering a question, um, please then turn your cameras on um, to be able to save some um, bandwidth space because we're having some internet um, issues uh, this uh, afternoon. So thank you, appreciate your collaboration with that. We will continue on block one. Um, we already heard from Senator DeGraff. Now we will hear from Senator Carla Joseph. Uh, we are seven minutes. You may proceed, Senator Joseph. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I greeted uh, the testifiers initially in my uh, time. Uh, so I will greet you again, uh, all the testifiers in block one, and of course, our listening and viewing audience. Uh, Commissioner Barry Benjamin, my questions are will gear to page three of your testimony. I was inquiring where in the hiring process are you with the district athletic directors. Okay, thank you for your question, Senator. 
those directors are going to be hired through our federal funding, and I will have to have our superintendents respond to that because it's it's not it's not at my um, level; it's at the district level. Let me see if I, um, we were able to get them back on. Not only are you experiencing internet issues on your end, but we are too here at the VIDE, and our testifiers are having to lag on and off, on and off um, as well. I'm not seeing them on at this time, Senator. Um, well, then I will me, try to get me, them back on. They, let me they, 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 they'll get on. Okay, let me continue with the question and so my time don't rule get away from me and I and I lose a lot of my time. Um, I I will move on to page five of your your testimony and I wanted to ask you um, to delineate on some of these programs that you have, uh, specifically the one that you offer uh, the certifications for the coaches. Uh, is this a question you could answer or you would have to wait on your supporting staff? I wanted to know the number of coaches thus far that have been certified by these programs. Would you be able to answer that Thank question? You. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Bernalyn Toma is online, and she works directly with the DSA office. Ms. Toma? Good afternoon, Senator Joseph. Bernal went to program assistant for St. Thomas St. Croix. I mean, St. Thomas and St. John. At this present time, most of our coaches, I could say we have about 30, 35 coaches or more that's been certified for 2018, 2019 school year. However, for the upcoming season, we're going to get a new submittal of coaches, whoever the principals pick, and then they will be going through this program they'll be vetted and whoever had their certification will have to recertify every year okay so you have sufficient coaches to begin the sporting programs for this school year correct for clarity senator the put the principles that is something that's done on the school based level mr Thomas cannot answer that question because when the school year i'm sorry when the Sporting activities begin. It's that's when we'll get a final count as to who's coaching the different sports. That is something that principals decide and share with us. Okay, and so you don't have that information yet because we just began the uh, sporting year in truth because of the pandemic and the like. Correct. Correct. Okay. Understood. Correct. Understood. Okay. Now I I'm on page six. I'm going along with your your testimony. So I wanted to know who are your stakeholders for this student athlete roadmap to college. You mentioned you have stakeholders and it's, it's a guide that is still being in the process of being developed and I, I want to really commend you for putting a date for for your, your timeline to meet uh, the deadline to release this, which is February 14th. It's a beautiful day. That's Valentine's Day. So I hope we have a lot of heart <laughs> and put a lot of heart in it. So tell me, uh, who were the stakeholders? Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, so in a nutshell, there are a variety of stakeholders from our parents, our students, our counselors, um, principals, Every group of individuals, our assistant commissioner at the time, who work with students to make sure that they have a roadmap, uh, clear steps towards their college education, those student athletes who would like to play sports in college. So everyone from the school-based level to the leadership level here at the Department of Education, um, Senator. Okay, so did you involve the individuals from Two the Interscholastic Athletic Association? Are they part of your stakeholders? I cannot answer, yeah, I cannot answer that question. I know we have some entities, specific entities here. Um, Mr. Callender, I'm not sure. Ms. Toma, are you sure? Do you have that list? I know Mr. Callender does, and like I stated earlier, Please excuse him. Um, he's experiencing a medical emergency. We did, we him did. and AC some at this time. We did hear you, and we understand those medical emergencies. We all have them as humans as we age, especially yes. they come on really rapidly. So we do understand and appreciate yeah, and that. 
Thank you, Senator. So I'm, I, I don't have the list in front of me, but I don't see why they would not be a part of that vetting. It, it is going through the vetting process. I'm not sure if he reached to IAA as yet. Okay. Or, and other stakeholders. Okay. And I still have the, um, the initial question I asked, but I'll hold that. Uh, if the, the chairman would allow. And I do have a question, and this was not in your, and this question is for Commissioner Ustak Encarnacion. Uh, I know you're working in partnership. You indicated that with the Department of Education. What does that partnership look like uh, as far as supplies are concerned? How does that partnership look as far as Supplies is concerned for testing and assuring that masking is, is available. 30 seconds. So, uh, uh, well, Commissioner Raquel Berry, Benjamin, to uh, speak to the fact that the masks are now a part of their uniforms, and that is man, uh, mandatory. Um, we do not uh, supply the masks to the students or the schools. I know that uh, um, funding has been provided from the federal um, guidelines to provide those kind of things to students if indeed they need to. But being part of the uniform, I'm sure that's a, a, a parental responsibility as well. In Time. terms of testing, we have... We have not only supplied all testing um, to the Department of Education, we have educated the nurses that are part of the Department of Education. Uh, we've done a lot of training with the, edu with the, with the principals, with the teachers, um, and we've conducted the testing. We have gone into contractual ar arrangements or in the process of going into contractual ar arrangements with five um, private entities to ensure that the testing can be done on an ongoing basis throughout the territory. So those are the things that we've done. And, and, re, and we also provide guidance. We uh, pro provide approval for um, projects that they put in place or want to put in place. Um, we're ready to sit down and speak with them with the protocols having to do with beginning the sports and, and fitness program back up at the, the schools, no matter what age group we're looking at, looking at not only CDC guidance, but um, testing. We're working with them in February. We're now going to, we had a meeting yesterday. We're going to be working with them on a vaccination incentive program meeting at the different schools where parents and students alike can come and be vaccinated. It's starting with two on St. Croix and two, and two schools on St. Thomas. So those are the type of um, arrangements we've been working on together. Okay, I, I wanted to just uh, wrap up, if I may, Mr. Chairman. You may wrap up, Senator. Thank you. I wanted to just wrap up and, and ask you both to just continue the level of collaboration. I, I really am pleased to hear that you are looking, and I, I would have hoped you have already contracted an entity to do those rapid tests in school so that we could have a quick identification and individuals could be quarantined rapidly so that it doesn't uh, spread, the pandemic doesn't spread within the schools. And I, I would hope, Mr. Chairman, I will have another question, but I don't want to abuse my time. So thank you very much, ladies, uh, for your testimony and for being here and, and sitting up through our long recess. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Joseph. Our pleasure. Senator, Senator Carrion, may I um, add to her last comment? Yes, yes, you may. Just to let, just to let everyone know, the, we are using the rapid testing. Um, the, the two days and, and ongoing that we've been testing, we have been able to report all of the positives between a, within a 24-hour period. So we will continue to do so um, from henceforth. So that's, that's something that we've done and will continue to do. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Commissioner. Uh, now, let me ask you, uh, are nurses at the different schools allowed to do uh, testing for the students? Yes, and they've been trained to do so, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I also would like to inform that the uh, IAA president for the St. Croix District, Ms. Hubson, excused herself. She had a family emergency, and hence why she's not present of uh, this today at, at uh, today's hearing. So uh, we would like to excuse her. Uh, Senator um, Franklin Johnson, you're recognized for your seven minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for this time. Good afternoon to the testifiers. Good afternoon to the listening, viewing audience. Um, Commissioner Barry, I, I would like to ask about the equipments 
When was the last time the department um, updated the equipment or purchased new equipment for the athletic um, programs? Thank you for the question, Senator. Ms. Toma can give a response. Good afternoon, Senator Johnson, Bernal and Toma program assistant. The last time we bought any equipment, it was donated in 2018. So as of present, so since then, we haven't purchased any new equipment or anything for athlete, athletic programs. At this time, no, we haven't have we haven't purchased any any equipment. Do we have intention of purchasing some for the new school year? Yes, we do. All right, thank you. And um, again, to Commissioner yeah. Berry, the student athletic tracking system is the agent is the department buying this software or it's a contractor's going to be doing this tracking of these uh, athletes. Commissioner Berry? Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question, Senator. Yes, the department will be managing the software. And and again to you, uh, Commissioner Berry, um, all of your students, will will they be mandatory vaccination? Because I heard, uh, I think it was Miss Hodge said that with their program, everybody, half is mandatory vaccination. In, in the schools, is it going to be mandatory? Are you asking, Senator, if all students in the, the schools in the athletic programs. will be vaccinated or student athletes in the schools will be vac mandatory student, vaccinated? Student athletes. Not... Student athletes. Okay. So that is a parent you had your question. That is a parent's choice, Senator, to vaccinate their, their child or children. If students want to play sports, then the parent will make that decision as to whether or not they can play based on um, their willingness to vaccinate or not. So once the parents makes that decision, if they're vaccinated, they can play. If they're not vaccinated, they cannot play in IAA sports. And, and what about the bubble concept that we had uh, last year? I think it was a joint effort between uh, Parks and Rec and Education. Do you guys have intention on doing that program again? Um, yes, Senator. We do not, of course, as you know, we cannot predict um, how long and okay. how far we're going to be in, in COVID-19. But absolutely, that is that is always on the table. And I know we've had discussions around not just uh, doing the the softball, baseball competition like we did honor, when we honored um, Genix, yeah. but we do want to look at other sports as well. So that's a yes. The specifics on which sport we cannot say because um, we have to respond and plan according to the various the, the variant at the time. And I, I thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Berry. And Commissioner Incarnacion, I, I saw in your testimony that the department the department recommends that all youth athletic receive health screening and clearance from health care provider prior to resuming athletic activities. Is the department at least between education or Department of Health or each child parent will have to provide this Three screening minutes. from the health care service. So that that was um, speaking to child children that have been tested positive to the school system and into the sports arena. And the reason why is because they're, um, as I explained, they're, they're neurological as well as cardiac issues that may arise. And just to be sure that they're clear, the recommendation, the strong recommendation is that if you are tested, you have been tested positive, and you're going back into playing sports, you should be seen by your physician prior to going back into sports. Okay. And again, to you, Commissioner Ikana, so how many of the person that are right now hospitalized are under the age 17? I'm going to... Um, turn that over to Dr. Esther Ellis, who has more of those demographics. Okay. 
Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Esther Ellis, um, tertiary epidemiologist for Department of Health. Um, I will get you those numbers. It'll take me about five minutes to look at today's hospitalization numbers. And, and, and while you looked for those numbers, can you also um, give us the numbers of how many fatality under the age 17 in the territory? And, and I'll move on to some other questions until you're ready. Okay, uh, and to clarify, out of our total fatalities? Under 17. Under 17. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We'll get that right now. Um, Commissioner Berry, I think I'll come back to you to try to figure out, and I think it's between you and probably the Commissioner of Health, but I think it would be more Commissioner Berry. What are sports right now are you guys considering high risk? I, I can begin to answer that question from a health perspective. Okay, sure. And so right now, football and, ba and basketball would be the two. One minute. Basketball, of, sure, of course, would be the highest risk because there's more contact in that with football as well. Commissioner Berry, any other sports? That, 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 is, a, that is correct, Commissioner. Um, that is correct, Commissioner. Ms. Toma, do we have any other sports that are considered um, high risk due to the increase in contact, physical contact. Those are the two we, we discussed. 30 seconds. Breno went to my program, program assistant. No, only tackle football at this time and basketball from the health is a high risk sport. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I you. think my final question would be to the commissioner. Do you have a process in place for the students to understand the basic of athletic recruiting process before deciding if it is an avenue they want to uh, pursue? Time. I'm not sure if I understand your question, Senators. Um, to pursue as what, a career? Yeah, to, to pursue in athletic programs. Some, sometimes some students come to school, no knowledge, no idea about the athletic programs or have no interest. So I'm trying to find out if you have something in place to show them that these are avenues and direction that they can go that sometimes have that career in a professional um, athletic um, skill. Okay, so um, so Senator, yes. The, the First of all, the, our programs themselves, um, prior to COVID, of course, the operation of our programs, the students playing ball, basketball, football, whatever it may be, is the first um, area of, of inspiration for some students. And of course, they would inquire with the respective coaches, teachers, or whomever. Um, as it relates to a uh, documented path, that's exactly one of the initiatives that is outlined in my testimony the pathway to college, it's a career track that students will, students, parents, um, counselors, everyone will have to educate children on what they're gonna need if they're going to pursue um, a career in sports, um, especially if they would like to, uh, college to pay for that. Thank you very much. It's Anna. gonna be released on February 14th, Senator, so the public will be aware of that. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll wait for the response for my question from the Department of Health in, in lieu of the um, numbers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Very well. Hi. Um, Dr. Uh, Ellis? And uh, Dr. S. Ellis, I'm, I'm back. Um, we, have, we currently have one individual that's hospitalized under the age of 17, and we have had zero deaths of anyone under the age of 17. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Elias, so uh, during this whole pandemic, we've only had one individual under the age of 17 that has been hospitalized, or you're just mentioning currently we just have one? Currently we have one. We have had many individuals throughout this pandemic that have been hospitalized. Um, that would be a slightly longer analysis that I could provide by the end of the day if you want that total as well. Yeah, if you could provide that to us. Um, how many youth lies under the age of 17 that, you know, during this process, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much for that. Um, Senator Payne, you're now recognized for your seven minutes. Good afternoon, Senator, how are you? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, 
thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon to the testifiers. Uh, good afternoon to listen of you and audience. Uh, Commissioner Berry, I'm going to start with you. Can you hear me? I can, Senator. Good afternoon. Okay, good. Um, can you explain to me uh, what is being done for our student athletes who are on a fast track for scholarship to college playing sports such as basketball or football to ensure that they still remain competitive and attractive to respective college scouts? Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, so the Division of Sports have, as you know, worked in collaboration with the Department of um, Sports, Parks and Recreation to increase footage, video, et cetera, to help our students in their application for college. That's number one. Internally, our counselors at our schools are still charged with helping our students to enter college um, or colleges of their choice, so apply for college at colleges of their choice. That is still the process in light of COVID or not. The students, we, we've had graduates who entered college since 2020, since 2021, graduation season, and the process still remains. Our counselors are charged with ensuring that our students are educated on the career path, I'm sorry, the, the pathway to enter college. So whether they're student athletes or other students who are interested in other aspects of um, college, they are required and they had to assist our students on that pathway. Senator, we will have a more formalized documentation of that process, which um, is scheduled to release on February 14th, and that is indicated in the testimony as well. Okay, I was kind of focusing on the, uh, the student athletes. Uh, I'm trying to get get um, a, a handle of how are they remaining competitive? Are they having one-on-one uh, -on -one training with their, with their coaches and in the gyms? Are they continuing to weightlifting? Like, what what are they doing? Okay, uh, okay, so, oh, okay. I, I understand your question now. I'm sorry. No, our our we did not, as you know, because of COVID, we have not had students in school physically. And the students who were back on our campuses were those students in pre-K through third, our student athletes, where there were no specific training for them during this COVID period. Um, for any student athlete who wanted to, who, who has an interest in, in sports or even um, seeking college funding um, for, for their, their athletic abilities. Now that they're coming back to school, that is something that they will engage in as they customarily do. Thank you. Thank you. And also, um, you, you referenced in your testimony that you held vaccination drives in an effort to vaccinate students, coaches, and others, but it wasn't as successful as planned. Uh, what were the challenges and what measures have been implemented to overcome those challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. The vaccination drive we did for our, all of our employees as well as students. We welcome parents to bring their child, the challenges we believe at the time were because it, they just didn't show up in numbers. So the challenges we know we were fighting uh, against different uh, myths that were untrue around the vaccine, um, folks not being educated enough on it, not comfortable enough on it. Um, Senator, I do recall you sharing with us your testimony at one point to, to try to help to convince those um, individuals who were skeptics at the time. And that was our biggest challenge. What we're doing now, uh, we partnered after we partnered with the AFT Three minutes. to try to get members of the AFT out. Um, that was not successful. And what we're doing is once our students return, we have a number of creative conversations with those students who are vaccinated to share their experience with other students as well as parents so that they can talk about their experience um, being vaccinated and why they felt it was important to do. So, so we, we're just, we just have to keep at it, and that is the goal. Okay. Um, Ms. Haja, you're on line? Ms. Haj, are you on line? Is anyone from IEA on line? Seems like uh, Ms. Hodge is not online. We'll try to contact her, um, Senator. Okay, um, Commissioner Encarnacion, uh, are you online? 
Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, uh, good. I had a question for Ms. Hart, but you, 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 you can all um, answer it as well. Um, Ms. Hart stated in her testimony that all individuals involved in events hosted by the association must be vaccinated. Um, is it your belief or understanding that only unvaccinated persons can contract and or spread coronavirus? And is the virus spread by both vaccinated and un unvaccinated persons in the same manner? Or if you're vaccinated, you cannot contract or spread the virus? Okay. Could you clarify so, for the public, please? Of course. Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, I'm going to begin, and of course, Dr. Ellis, feel free to come in and, and um, conclude with that. Every Omicron has definitely shown to us, and we even before Omicron, we had some out, um, some some outbreaks in reference to some breakthrough, I should say, with vaccination. So even if you're fully vaccinated, you can still contract the the virus. It's not that One you're not va being vaccinated so that you could never get the virus. You're vaccinated so that if you're exposed to the virus, one, your immunity level will help fight it off, and you may not contract it. You may contract it, but at a, at a, at a different level. Or, um, like I said, you may not contract it at all. But it also allows you the ability of not being as sick or dying. That's a reason why you get the vaccine. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot transmit it. But because your viral load seconds. is going to be lower because you're immunized, once it's being transmitted, you're going to be transmitting a less severe form of the, the virus as well. Um, Dr. Ellis, do you want to expound upon that a little bit more? Hi, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Esther Ellis, uh, territorial epidemiologist. And just to add to that, um, you're much less likely, as Commissioner Encarnacion said, to transmit the virus if you're vaccinated. And the reason for that being your um, body, because it is vaccinated, is able to quickly Time. mount an immune response and neutralize the virus before it reaches really high levels. And that's why that's why you're less likely to transmit it. It is possible, but the ultimate goal of the vaccine, um, which does work, is to prevent severe disease and hospitalization and death. Okay, thank you, uh, and Commissioner. And can I say, uh, in your testimony, you stated that only 17% of the territory's youth are fully vaccinated. Uh, what, in your opinion, has been the biggest obstacle for getting our children vaccinated? It also depends. On, it, you have to look at the parents of the youth, and a lot of it is it's the concerns and the, and the um, the fear. As we have to admit, there is some fear and uh, some concerns from that. So if you as a parent it's like eating vegetables, a lot of parents don't like vegetables, so they don't feed it to their children, and uh, they have some concerns, some fears or, or or query about the vaccine. So if they're not vaccinated, then in turn their children are not going to be vaccinated. It's for us as health care providers, as specialists like Dr. Hunt, who's not with us today, but also Dr. Ellis and other um, health care workers to explain the benefits of the vaccine and the reduced risk of, of having the vaccine at that point in time. And we'll continue to do that as long as we need to do that so that we can get as the, the level of immunity that's needed. I think, and we repeat this, and I, I think it's important to go on and say, this is a pandemic. We are not going to be relieved of the pandemic until the entire world has a level of immunity needed. And we spoke a little bit about pandemic versus endemic earlier today on a radio show that what Dr. Ellis and I popped in, in and we we'll continue to speak about that. It's not going to be noted as an endemic until we can say that it's something that is less severe and we know it's going, we, we might be exposed to it on an annual basis, just like the flu, but there will be a vaccine available to prevent severe illness. And um, last year, um, Commissioner Brayman. Yes, Senator, your time was called, so you, 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 you may wrap up, Senator Payne. Oh, I, I apologize. I, apologize. I didn't know. I apologize. I didn't know. Um, just one last. Um, yeah, I, you may wrap I, up. I apologize. Sir. I didn't hear that the time was called. Okay. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Berry, Commissioner uh, in Connection stated that only 17% of the territory's youth are fully vaccinated. So since it seems like hardly any of the youth are vaccinated, rather than um, saying that only vaccinated children can participate in sports, are there COVID funds that can be utilized to test the students using rapid tests before they participate in any sporting activity and include all children? Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, uh, thank you for the time. 
thank you. And I'm not sure if I, yes, I could respond, but I think in Co Commissioner Incarnacion is um, best suited to, based on our previous discussion. Right, and, and, and I also like Dr. Ellis to jump in with this because it's important to note that, um, you know, that, that there's also a possibility of false negatives being uh, something that's identified. So you do not want to rerun that risk, especially as someone that's unvaccinated. Um, so yes, monies are available and we are willing to test as many times as, as we can test, but there's also a risk that still is posed. So the best option right now is to have everyone fully vaccinated prior to entering sports. But we're willing to do those testing, Senator Payne, that you spoke about. Uh, Dr. Ellis, is there anything that um, should be added to that conversation? Nothing to add, just to reiterate that um, the vaccine is the number one protection, followed by a mask but it's not gonna guarantee that everybody is 100% negative at a particular sporting event. And it also matters when you test. If you test the day before the sporting event, there could be people that are positive the next day. The incubation period for Omicron is much shorter than the other variants, and we don't know what new variants will bring, will bring as far as incubation, but someone could be negative in the morning and positive by lunchtime. Um, so testing is, is a tool along with all the others that we have as part of mitigating this virus. Okay, thank you, responses. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the time. You're welcome, Senator Payne. I would like to recognize the presence of non-committee member, Senator Janelle Saru. Thank you, Senator Saru, for joining us. Um, I heard a point of inquiry. Senator Joseph, you recognize her point of inquiry. Uh, thank you kindly, uh, Mr. Chairman. I did have a point of inquiry relative to um, Commissioner Instituted Athlete Foundry. Is there any cost to the Department of Education? I noted in your presentation, you indicated there's no cost uh, to the athletes, the students, or their family, but is there a cost associated to the Department of Education? And don't uh, forget, I'm still holding on for the no, answer. So there's no cost at all? Okay. No, Senator. Okay, and then I still have that question that's outstanding. Uh, the answer to the question outstanding, where are you in the process with hiring the district athletes? Ms. Harmon? Uh, district directors, rather. Athletic director. Good, uh, good afternoon, Senator. Um, we are in the final stages, and so our, the, the job should be posted next week, and then we'll begin interviews thereafter. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Senator uh, Johnson, you're recognized for your point of inquiry. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, to the Department of Health, my question is, uh, do you guys have any record or any information of any minor child having adverse reaction to the vaccine? And if so, what kind of assistance was provided to family members if that did occur? In reference to, to um, there have been some episodes where we have some allergic reactions or very mild to vaccine. I know of, of a, a couple cases. Dr. Ellis um, might be able to give you a little bit more specifics, or if not, then we can get that information to you at a later date. Dr. Ellis, do you have any more specific in reference to the number of individuals that have been, um, that have shown some reaction and the support given to the families? Um, yes, good afternoon. Uh, we have not had any severe reactions among children for the 5 to 11 group, if that's what you're asking. Um, and any adverse reactions are reported to the CDC. And the CDC also summarizes any severe reactions that have been seen in that age group, but no severe reactions in our children here in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, what I can say is that we always, um, Senator Johnson, if I may, we all, I always make sure that I refer um, any adverse reactions to Dr. Ty Hunt Caesar, who calls individuals personally. So if you know of anyone who has not gotten a call from us, please let us know. Uh, Mr. Chair, 
May, may I please follow up on this? You, you, you may. I, I think I hear two different answers here. And I, I, I thought I heard the Commissioner of Health say that they have had younger person with adverse reaction. And then I think I hear the, um, the Dr. Ellis saying that we haven't. And, and I, I need to be clear, if we have, and, and if we did, what follow-up treatment or assistance did we give to the family members? Okay, so, so basically we said the same thing using different words. I said <laughs> adverse reaction and she said symptoms. So it's basically the same thing. So we have had mild adverse reactions or allergic reactions. So it would be the same, same definition, different words being used. Correct. And severe as adverse reaction would be somebody that required hospitalization. Um, so we have not had any severe adverse reactions. And but uh, we did say and the for same those thing, that did, clarify. what assistance did you give to the family? That's it for me, Mr. Chief. So it would be a con contact with a physician, so that or recommendation that they either go to emergency room or see what their private physician. Um, there are medications that that can be given if allergic reactions occur, depending on the level of allergies that you're seeing. And so those are the support that we've been given. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Senator Johnson. Thank you for that question. A follow up to that, because I think Dr. Elias said from 5 to 11, what about um, minors that are under 18 to 11? Anything to report on that? Similar for that age group, um, as far as no severe adverse reactions that required hospitalization, some minor um, reactions such as pain at the injection site, fever, fatigue, headache, myalgia, which is just muscle pain, but no severe adverse reactions in that age group as well. And just to remind you, the reason why we keep track of those groups separately is because the 5 to 11 is a different dose. It's a third of the dose that are given to the 12 and ups. Um, and uh, just wanted to clarify that difference. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Francis, you're recognized for your seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to you, my colleagues, and good afternoon to the testifiers. I thank you for your testimony, testifiers thus far. Uh, Commissioner Berry, um, I want to also publicly welcome back our students to in-person school and to just ask you how have the adjustment been? Hi, Senator. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your sentiments and warm welcome. Um, our students have been slowly, um, yet very, very graciously entering our campuses. Did you ask about the testing or the return? Uh, just, just the return generally, but if you have information regarding the testing, um, I know that there were some concerns that I heard over the radio shows as well as to uh, calls to our office that there's still some, um, some, some, I don't want to use the word confusion, but there seems to be some delay in some testing um, requirement as well. If you want to address that, that'll be good. Okay, okay. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I can speak about the return. The testing, as you know, is something that the Department of Health manages. Um, they just happen to be our students. So Department of Health is here with us today and can respond to that. But our students have been um, returning to our campuses very excitingly. And our teachers, of course, um, excited to welcome them as well. We haven't had uh, much of any, if, if, if at all, any concerns because parents were notified if they did not have uh, the proper testing results that were negative, students should not return to campus until they do. And the, we have checkers at each of our gates that check to make sure that students were in fact negative and each child was given a wristband so that for the remainder of this week, they don't have to present the negative COVID um, result each day. The wristband says that they've been checked and approved for having negative results. But other than that, we have happy smiling faces on our campuses um, and we look forward to you know, having just discussions with them to make sure that they uh, understand the school campus they understand um, what social distancing look like. So, so we're off to a good start. Uh, very well. And, um, you know, obviously today we're talking about the uh, sports and athletic programs within our um, respective Department of Education schools. 
Uh, seems like there is a, a very good roadmap, um, game plan on paper. And ultimately, who do you have responsible for overseeing and to continue to monitor compliance and implementation of, of your roadmap and um, you know, some of the protocol that you, you have put in place? Thank you, Senator. Um, if you're talking about school sports um, or any protocol with students, it is our school principals that manage the data there on our school campuses. Our coaches, whoever those individuals will be approved by the principal, they are the ones responsible for implementing the safety protocols um, once out and about. And of course, our office, um, this uh, division of sports and athletics, also have a role in making sure, reminding um, our coaches and anyone else, parents, students, about the safety protocols that we must practice upon their return and at the start of um, at the start and during of any competition that we might have. Very well, and uh, Commissioner, obviously, um, our students, especially our athletic students, um, have kind of fell behind. Um, because of the lack of, of activities, and those are consistent with the pandemic situation that we're in. In respect to those individuals that may be vaccinated or unvaccinated, how are we um, you know, recognizing the need for uh, you know, weekly testing to be done by those quote unquote professional athletes um, that we know that that's um, along the um, competitive spectrum? How are we treating those and how are we accounting for weekly testing for those individuals? Thank you, Senator. And um, the, Depart the Commissioner of Health, Ms. Hustain Kanasion, um, briefly spoke about how we plan to do that because, of course, we, de we rely on the Department of Health for the their guidance and leadership in this process. We, we have um, plans to do that, and they will advise as to the who, what, when, where, and how for us to get that done. I'm not sure. And once they say, we will abide. I don't know if, um, Ms. Encarnacion, if you'd like to provide additional information. The recommendation right now would be every two weeks. Um, and of course, if, if Omicron continues to, to dissipate as it is, then of course, once a month. If we need to test more frequently, if a, the reason arises, we have the number of test kits available. And um, our nurses in the school have always uh, have also been trained on testing. And we've, we are now going into contractual arrangements with five um, business entities throughout the territory who have our, um, also agreed to test um, individuals in the school systems as well. So we, ha we have it pretty covered. Very well. Commission, I noted in your, in your testimony that you made reference to the fact that the Department of Health, um, that you're prepared to work with the entity Sports Park and Recreation and Department of Education. Uh, can you speak to what is, what is the current engagement? Um, because I, I just take, when I, when I read that you are prepared to do it, um, you know, it leave me to wonder whether or not it's being done. Um, can you just expand on that a little bit for me, please? Okay, for um, one of the things that that um, needs to happen, and um, Commissioner Barry Benjamin spoke about protocols and, and and policies. Of course, when they're presented, we are going to be reviewing those protocols and policies to make sure they're fitting the guidelines for COVID nineteen. But the preparation that I was speaking about has already begun. Um, in in my uh, testimony, also we spoke about um, ten thousand students as well as two thousand faculty and staff that within. Um, from last week and going forward to next week, as we are staggering the beginning of school, we've started that, and I think it's been very successful. Um, Dr. Ellis has the correct number of positive tests that we've seen while we we're while we've been testing, but we tested Saturday and Sunday, and on those two days we saw, we saw 72 positives. So I felt that even if we saw one positive, it would have been worth all those tests. So we um, we meet on an ongoing basis. We met yesterday, having to do with the vaccine seconds. drive that we're going to be working on. Um, I could check off the list, but um, I think that um, sometimes um, we meet with education more than we meet with ourselves. So it's a coordinated effort, and um, it's 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 up and running. We've started it last year, 2020 in June, and we haven't stopped. Very well. Thank you. And um, Commissioner Barry Benjamin, in respect to equipment, do we have um, adequate and sufficient equipment in our schools right now? 
um, to, I guess, uh, some uh, time, obviously, to engage our students in the, the athletic programs. Do we have the necessary equipment as well as the uh, teachers uh, to support the sports and events at these schools? Thank you for the question, um, Senator. The superintendents will have to indicate if any principal informed of a need for specific equipment that they may not have. Our superintendents are on the line, and they can indicate that if they were notified. Good afternoon, Senator Acting Insular Superintendent Arisola Atli Herman here for the St. Croix District. Um, working with our Health and Physical Education Coordinator, Ms. Ophelia Jackson, we've identified a listing of equipment that we need at each grade level. Um, that funding has been allocated, and we're in the procurement process to ensure that all equipment is in place. Each one of our, I think your second question was about staffing, and each one of our schools has a health and physical education teacher. Um, our high schools have upwards of three to four, so we do have the adequate staffing in place as well. Thank you. Acting, Acting Superintendent, can I ask you to be, um, if you have a timeline for the procurement and delivery of the uh, sporting equipment? So, I don't have an exact timeline, but I do know that our goal is to get it into our schools as soon as possible, once we walk through the proper procurement process. Very well, and I don't need to belabor this, Mr. Chair, if I could just ask, um, is that for this school year or for next school year? This and next school year. Very well, thank you. We thank do you, have Mr. a staggered plan. Thank, thank, thank you. You're welcome, Senator Francis. Uh, Senator Saru, you're recognized for your seven minutes. Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to those testifying. Um, I came on this, the floor specifically because when you know better, um, you do better. And I would venture to say that I am the only Division I athlete in this body politic. And the answers today are a bit nauseating. And this is not for the Department of Health, because the Department of Health, they're doing their job to protect the population from any outbreak or any fatal um, outcome that can happen from the pandemic. And Commissioner Encarnacion, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have one of the top tennis players during her time that went to school on a full tennis scholarship as your assistant commissioner, correct? Correct. Very pleased to say that, yes. You have Senator, I'm no longer hearing you by means of Dr. Sims. And in the testimony before Senator, us, I'm no longer hearing you. Can you hear me? No, no, can we can. No, no, we can. Okay, now you can. Are you about 20 seconds of my time, Mr. Chair? <clears throat> And the testimony before us from the Department of Education, and I'd like to say the come for education, but I have to at this juncture, is the same testimony, moreover, um, that was given the last time the chair had a, a hearing on this very same topic. Everything is what will be done, but I can't identify what has been done. So COVID is a new norm. And if we, when we wanted tourists to come to this territory, we created provisions. We created a portal in no time. We assembled a National Guard at the, the airport, and we found ways for tourists to come. When we wanted cruise ships to come to the dock, we lobbied and lobbied and joined people's court cases and begged the CDC to allow cruise ships to come to our ports. We allowed bars and restaurants to ease restrictions because they are money makers. And the way that we have done our athletes in this territory is unconscionable. You're trying to tell me, we're talking about games. Let's forget the games. For an, when you had the bubble, and I watched the bubble, those athletes looked, for lack of a better word, not so good performing. And they looked not so good because they were out of shape. So we focus on athletics and having a, 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 a game. 
But every athlete knows that preparation begins off the court. So in the time that these students have been home, Ms. Tomar, has the department procured training equipment to train in a COVID safe environment? Yes or no? Please hold the senator's time. Uh, Commissioner <laughs> Raquel Barry Benjamin, were you able to hear the senator's question? Senators. I'm sorry, Raquel I thought she asked. I'm sorry, Senator, did you call my name? I'm sorry, I thought she asked. I'm sorry, Senator, did you call my name? Were you? I'm hearing an echo, Senator. Uh, Commissioner, were you able to hear the senator's question? Or you need her to repeat the question? I, I heard the senators. Uh, okay, uh, can I respond? Yes, you may. Okay, sorry, I, I, I wasn't aware if she called my name. No, no problem. I did hear part of her question, which spoke to if the department procured um, equipment to train in a COVID safe environment. Correct. Um, equipment to train in a COVID safe Yes or no? I'm sorry, Senator. She's, um, somebody has to fix the the senator's mic is coming in spotty. The senator's mic is. It is. Let's take a one and minute. I'm hearing an echo on my end. Yeah, let's take a one minute recess and see if media can um, improve Senator Saro's um, mic, please, so it could come a little bit more clear. Uh, thank you. The comedian, Youth Sports Park and Recreation, stands in a one minute recess.